everyone, this is Dr. Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. This is part two of the How to Become an Optometrist series. In this video, it's focused on those who are ready to apply for optometry school and they're going through the application process. If you're interested in learning more, keep on watching the video. So before we get into this topic, I did want to share a little bit about me. I am a practicing optometrist in New York City with a cold start practice line of sight in Hudson Yards. It's focused on modern vision wellness and curated eyewear. I graduated from the University of Virginia for undergrad and I went to Salis University for optometry school. Okay, so let's get right into it. This is probably a very stressful time, especially in 2020, to be applying for optometry school and not being sure about exactly what's going on. I know there's probably a lot of thoughts as to what's the best career to invest in going forward and if it's even a financially sound decision to make. If you're graduating from undergrad, this is a time period where you're trying to make the biggest life decisions about what to do and what steps to take to go after your career. And COVID has definitely put a huge, uh, I guess, stop for most people on this and having people reevaluate if it's the best decision going forward. So for those of you who are interested in applying to optometry school, this is around the period where you would typically apply. They definitely extended, uh, sorry, extended some of the deadlines for the applications, um, but let's talk about the generalized guideline or process how it works. After you graduate from undergrad, it's application process. Around June, um, or around June, I think mid-June, is when OptomCast opens, and that's where you submit your applications. OptomCast is a centralized application process where you would apply to the schools that you intend on going in for interviews that you're interested in and submit the necessary paperwork to apply to that school. Part of the necessary paperwork includes just putting in your information and as well as your letters of recommendation any information related to your personal statements as, as well as your resumes and your grades. And there's a lot that goes into a process of applying to optometry school. And this is a major life decision and it's something you wanna be sure that you wanna get into and then that you wanna do really well so that you stand out as an applicant. From personal experience, before getting into my tips and things that I wanna share, um, one thing is I took a year off after undergrad from UVA. I took a year off because I needed time for myself to really relax and feel like I'm mentally prepared for what's to come once I apply to optometry school. And I use that time to do two things. I use that time to work, so I earned money and saved it so that I could have some sort of savings to get through optometry school. And I also use that time to develop my experience working as an sorry, working as optometry, uh, optom a optometry assistant, uh, working full time. The last thing I did with my time was I was studying for my OATs. Um, so I didn't want to feel like I had to be rushed to apply for OATs right out of graduating school. I wanted some time to really relax and feel prepared to study. I think some people do have the concern that they might forget all the information that they learned um, and that they might just lose motivation to get into it. So it really depends on your type of personality. For me, I didn't think that a year was a big sacrifice from what I would gain from it, which is feeling renewed and refreshed to be prepared to go into optometry school, which is a very rigorous um, curriculum. And then I also had enough time to feel prepared for um, my OETs to do really well in it. Okay, so one of the things that is important is your recommendation letters that they are requiring you to upload on OptomCast. So on OptomCast, they allow you to upload four recommendation letters and up to four. I don't know if each school really uh, I don't know if each school really requires four, but I do have some tips to share with you, at least what I would recommend in terms of who to ask and how to reach out. These are the three that I would suggest. The first is to ask someone that you've known for a long time. And it probably isn't someone that is a professor at your school or anyone in the academic curriculum. Um, and the reason why I say that is someone that can speak on your behalf authentically and Honestly, it really does carry an impact in terms of the recommendation letter and it's something that the admission boards would be able to tell. And I think that is very knowledgeable information. 
um, in terms of the application process. They want to be sure that they pick someone that is going to be very agreeable with the rest of the students that um, has a personality where they will continue to push through and work hard and just all around good person. So having someone that speaks on that is quite important. The second thing is to have someone that um, is in the academic curriculum and within that uh, there's many people you can ask. So specifically, if you are able to and you've built that connection, I would choose someone who is uh, higher up within the, I guess, academic ladder. Uh, so for me, I built a connection with the School of Dean of Medicine at University of Virginia because um, I definitely knew that I wanted to be in medicine starting my first year, but I wasn't quite sure especially what degree or uh, what specialty. So I early on made a connection and kept up with the, the dean and over time that built a relationship that was trustworthy and he was able to provide me with an awesome amazing letter of recommendation. Um, if not, you could choose a professor that you've taken um, multiple courses from or that's really known that's really known you on a personal level. And I know a lot of these classes that you go to, they're big classroom um, teaching styles and you're not really getting to know the teacher one-on-one. -on -one. So I probably wouldn't choose from, from them because they may not have a lot to say about, I guess, you as a student other than your grades. The third person I would recommend for your recommendation letter is either from your work experience that you've worked for, someone that you've shadowed at, or someone that you've volunteered for, uh, specifically within optometry, because it does relate to the school that you're applying to. I don't know what I'm trying to say. And they can speak on behalf of specific things related to eye care and the, tra the traits and qualities that you have that will make you a great potential candidate. Okay, the next important thing on the application for optometry school is your personal statement. That is probably one of the hardest things for me. I'm not personally a great writer, so um, coming up with the proper way to convey your message and who you are within one piece of paper is quite hard and obviously very important. Um, I have three tips for that. So the first tip is please just don't repeat things that they already would know in your application um, regarding your grades, what school you went to, and just I want to become an optometrist to help people. They know that. Um, I would convey that in other ways. Number two is to tell a story. If you've ever watched an amazing movie that you remember, you always stuck by the key character and you rooted for them. It's because you developed a bond with that person through the story and you've seen their ups and downs and you support them. And exactly like that, that's how a personal statement should be. You want to be able to share a story that's authentic so that the person on the other end who's reading the personal statement can relate or understand and make a connection with you. So sharing personal experiences is really great for that. So I remember for my personal statement, I had two sort of narratives. And the first narrative was focused on my experience as a patient experiencing an eye condition that was life-changing. And that was in high school, I slept in my contact lenses and I woke up with a almost visually impairing corneal ulcer that I had to treat for almost a month. And that taught me a lot about the importance of vision and eye health. Um, second narrative for my personal statement was focused on the traits and how I found inspiration in the optometrist that I either worked for or shadowed. So in that personal statement, I talked about how I uh, went to, I attended Berkeley for their opto camp one year. And during that process, I learned about optometry and I followed the students I remember vividly having to go into their clinic and the fourth, third and fourth years were doing their um, office rotations and in clinic, we are all were required to dilate our eyes as guinea pigs for the students to practice on. Um, so we were dilated and had our vision, our vision checked and during dilation, one of the fourth years found a huge retinal tear. I luckily was able to fly back to Virginia, which is where I was living at the time, and I had um, both an optometrist and a retinal specialist take a look at it, and I was followed periodically with an optometrist. And in my narrative and my statement, I shared that experience about how I was treated with so much, I guess, care uh, on a personal level and how 
I saw by going in routinely and seeing the optometrists how much they truly loved their job. I saw how compassionate they were towards me and how empathetic they were. And in general, I also saw how happy they were with their lifestyle and they did not seem stressed. I shadowed a bunch of other specialties during my um, shadowing experiences and I saw that of all the specialties, it may have been biased because of who I shadowed, but the optometrists were the most well-rounded individuals um, of the doctors that I shadowed and they were the happiest with what they did for work um, and they didn't seem that stressed. And so that really drew me towards optometry because not only are you choosing a career that you um, are helping people in, but you want to choose something that you can see yourself doing for many years. And um, I saw that when I, I guess, shadowed optometrists. That was a long-winded way of saying really your personal statements should be focused on your personal story, experiences that you've had that led you to want to become an optometrist, um, aside from just saying that you want to be able to help people. The next biggest thing is the OAT exam. It is very scary to take because it's probably the, other than the SATs, it's the second biggest exam that you'll have to take in order to get your degree. The last being um, your board exams once you're in optometry school. But for OATs, um, I know that it's such a big deal and that people do get concerned about how much time they need to study and any tips that they can find and how to study good ways to do this and do that. Um, I think many of you guys can find very valuable resources online and you'll find endless topics about how to study for your OAT exams. So I just only want to share my personal experiences with you guys and things that I wish I personally knew aside from stuff that you can just Google online. Um, I will say that I did take uh, about two months, two and a half full months to study for my OETs. Some people may prefer longer or shorter, um, so that it really depends on the person, but I think two and a half to two, two months to two and a half months is a great time frame. My first tip for you guys might sound a little strange. The tip is to take a mock OET exam before even studying anything. Um, that is a great way to figure out exactly what your weakest subject is and you will know immediately where to start and you'll have a good taste of the reference of how an exam question will be phrased so that when you start your setting process your mindset will be um, along that path when you read questions and digest information um, so i would recommend taking a mock exam before even opening a book to study the oet's um, in general I would recommend having some sort of study guide or program. Kaplan offers one for OATs. And I would also just use a lot of practice tests and study materials that you can get from the library or even online. Um, giving yourself practice exams over and over and over again is probably, um, I would say, one of the most important things aside from reading materials. You can read things, but it never will stick but giving yourself an exam and looking at the questions, um, I think works better. Just like if you have experience when you graduate. When you um, go into clinical rotations, you learn much more through actually doing it than you do by just reading it. So I would do as much practice exams. Here is a tip. If you run out of OET material, uh, materials to use or you can't find um, enough practice exams, start doing some of the um, dental exams. The DAT is very, very similar to the OETs and they also have their own set of mock questions that you can use as study. The last tip I had was to look at problems and questions backwards, just to understand the bigger picture of what the problem is asking. So I would look at a question, instead of getting too bogged down by that specific detail, I would think, what is this question trying to imply or ask me? Think about which category that would fall in and then answer from there. And if it's a question that you don't know, um, then I would skip it. This test is a marathon um, and you're allowed to skip questions. If you spend too much time on one, you may not be able to answer the other one. So it's more important that you answer all the questions and get back to, back to the ones that you don't know. So again, I would work on questions backwards, do a process of elimination, and then also skip questions uh, and mark it and come back to them. And one last thing is, you'd be surprised of how many physics and reading comprehension questions there were on the exam. I thought that it would skew like 75% math and science and like maybe 
20% uh, reading comprehension, sorry, 10% reading comprehension or something like that. But it was definitely a little bit more even, uh, which is something that I did not expect. So don't forget to review things that seem easier, like reading comprehension. Okay, so that brings us to the last one, which is interviews. Geez, that can be scary too. Uh, but just like anything with experience, you become better at it. So a lot of us coming out of undergrad um, and going straight into grad school, you're not having a lot of work experience where you are going in for interviews for jobs. My first tip for you guys also sounds crazy, but it is to start applying to as many jobs that you do not want so that you can be prepared for the interview. Um, something like that. So, and the reason why I say that is because you get the experience. I applied to as many jobs as I could and they were jobs that I didn't want. And the reason why I did that was because it prepared me for doing real interviews. First of all, it's free um, and it's free experience. And you'll learn things about how to, I guess, act in front of an employer and the questions that they ask. And over time, you start to develop strong abilities to communicate what you want to say and in a way that is, I guess, appealing and inviting and also unique. So that is my tip. Let's say you get an email and they tell you, you've just been selected to come in for an interview. That is amazing news. That's exciting and also very scary. So how can you prepare for an interview when you go in? The second step is how you present yourself when you interview. It has nothing to do with clothing, though you should dress professionally and you should dress well, but it more has to do with um, how you compose yourself. Confidence. Confidence is my tip number two. Confidence is sometimes, and it can be misconstrued as, um, okay, confidence can be conveyed in many, many ways. It can be conveyed on paper about what you say and can be conveyed through the things that you say. But the more important things that are subtle that you don't realize is that confidence is conveyed through your body language and your tone and your smile. Having the proper body language that shows that you are confident and assertive but not timid or shy uh, carries across. So if you're playing with your hair, shaking your feet or you're slouched or you're looking away and not making eye contact, that all comes across. So it's really important to carry confidence in both your body language, your posture, as well as making sure that what you say is clear and deliberate and um, also friendly. Okay, and my tip number three is to answer truthfully. I don't know if this seemed like a silly tip, but I'll explain why I say that. Um, when you go in for an interview, especially when your nerves get the best of you, it's very easy to sort of fluff yourself up and say things that you think they want to hear. The people who interview you, they're part of the missions and they've been doing this for, trust me, years. It's their job to interview you. So they've been doing this for so long that they can tell right through you if you're making things up. So when you are nervous and they ask you a question that stumps you or that you don't know, you just answer truthfully. And how would you, I guess, how would you rebound from that question if it caught you off guard? Well, here's one way to do it. If they ask you a question that you don't know, you answer truthfully and you can go forward by saying, but I learned this from that or I made this mistake and from this mistake, I become a better person and these are the things I've implemented to follow that track. Um, that's an example for if they ask you about your weaknesses or your flaws. So I would just answer truthfully, state the reasons why, and state the steps going forward and what you would change or have changed to become a better person or to make yourself a better applicant. So guys, I hope that was helpful for part two of the how to become an optometrist series. So again, this is focused for those who are currently in the application process. Good luck to you guys. You guys are tough if you've made it through 2020 so far. The next and last part of the series will be for the new grads who just graduated from optometry school. How do you navigate the real world post COVID and apply for jobs? How do you stand out as a applicant, especially when maybe not that many places are offering positions? And with the changes going on, what should you do to adapt going forward? So if you fall into that category, please 
continue to watch my next video. Thank you guys so much and subscribe. Awesome. Thanks guys. Until next time.